<clears throat> the implementation of the Companion Forest Charter was of equal significance for the rule of law. <clears throat> the Royal Forest was not an area of minor significance. It is estimated that between one quarter and one third of the whole of England was part of the Royal Forest. This forest was not simply woodland. It encompassed cultivated areas, even villages, which were privately held. Forest law trumped common law. The draconian rules of the forest, governing virtually anything that people could do in this substantial part of the nation, including on their own property, was administered in a tyrannical manner. It constituted an abuse of the royal prerogative in its most absolutist form. This is the background of the story of Robin Hood, still the only fictional character in the Dictionary of National Biography. The Forest Charter did result <clears throat> in improvements in the administration of forest law. For example, the death penalty for taking deer was abolished, although deer hunting remained the exclusive preserve of the kings. And you still had to get permission to hunt rabbits and pigs from the, from the king. The promise to reduce the extent of the royal forest was continually delayed until late in the reign of Edward I. It will no doubt come as a great shock to this audience to hear that in medieval times, political promises were not always kept. <laughs> it took a century, but these promises were eventually honoured. <clears throat> From the point of view of the majority of the population, not just free men, the Forest Charter was of greater practical significance than the Magna Carta. Much of the forest was a commons, including for timber, which was the essential fuel and building material, available even to peasants. The, uh, the Forest Charter deserves to be more widely remembered for its significant contribution to the rule of law in England. I might say that it was still on the books until the early 70s when it was superseded by contemporary environmental legislation. The combined effect of the restraint on the ability of the King to extract revenue by abuse of feudal incidents and by the enforcement of the Forest Charter resulted in a major containment of royal revenue. The development well, of Parliament out of the Thanks for joining us again, assembly. as you just heard from the legal professional. Magna Carta, or the Forest Charter, was definitely a story about Robin Hood. So, hopefully you've watched the other two videos that I did on Magna Carta and Grand Jury. If you have not, I'm going to link one up here now, and I'll have the other one linked somewhere later in the video. So I'd like to, to go over a couple of ideas with this and, and kind of correct the record on some things. First, it, it came to my attention that Mark Martin did not write the thing about the grand jury and there only being 12 people. He actually took that right out of the federal grand jury handbook, which in some ways is actually more frightening to me. I'm going to tell you what they were talking about. Before the Magna Carta, before the barons got together and put a sword to King John's throat, told him to sign it, the king, after William the Conqueror came and conquered England in 1066, the, the people there, they, they weren't real happy with the way that mainland Europe kind of governed the island, the British Isles. So... The king had, had trusted informants that would act as a jury and let him know the truth about crimes that would happen in villages and different towns around London. And that's what they, they consider the grand jury or the jury. And that's, that's not a grand jury. The grand jury was distinctly developed with the Magna Carta. And the grand jury is specifically to hold government officials accountable for their action. It's, it's the people's only source of accountability with the government. It's solely a common law thing. And where juries came from originally would be what they would call the hundred court or the court's baron, baron's court. And that would basically be once every three weeks, everybody in the town would get together. And if any man had any claim against any other man, they would bring it to the attention of the town's people and the entire town would sit as a jury to convict, decide not guilty. And I'm sure that most of the people in the town already knew what they were going to do before somebody even brought a claim because, well, people gossip. <laughs> 
And <clears throat> the idea of a jury goes all the way back. It, it goes back to biblical times when I was talking about the lady in the well in a video. I don't remember which video it was. But um, everybody who dragged the woman in front of Christ would have been the jury. And that's just how, how things went down. The jury was more or less kind of a, a mob, mob rule. And when they saw something that they didn't like, they would, they would bring the lawbreaker in, into a court. And they, they would judge. They would judge them. And they wouldn't hand this power over to, to some type of government or government official. So that's just kind of some history there. Uh, on the jury and and the court baron in the hundreds court that's what it was talking about in the Magna Carta where the king couldn't write a writ and take that case to a higher court to the king's court whatever they decided in the hundred court or in the court baron the king couldn't overrule that they, they couldn't lose their court a free man could not lose his court so that that's just a clear a couple of those things up now let's look at at what they talk about with a grand jury today and how they try to uh, you know how, how they try to tell people what it is and they're they're pretty much anything you look in or look towards or you go and get a YouTube video on it it's gonna tell you that the grand jury is there to find probable cause uh, the grand jury only listens to the prosecution, unless you're a government official, and then you can go before the grand jury and put up a defense. In certain states, that allow that. The grand jury can ask questions and subpoena witnesses and documents. The grand jury can investigate. They, they all say this. And the grand jury is held in secret. And before I kind of move on to some common sense things about what they're telling us and then showing how it lines up with exactly what I'm saying, I just wish to uh, show you the Maine Constitution, the Constitution of Maine, where in Article 1, Section 7, it says the same thing about everybody has the right to a grand jury indictment, except in cases of impeachment, or in such cases of offenses as are usually cognizable by a justice of the peace. And what they're saying right here is that when a man or a woman comes in and indicts somebody else, accuses somebody else, and they're putting their testimony, their facts upon the record of the court, you don't have to have a grand jury indictment. Very, very clear. With all these things that we can agree about with the grand juries there for probable cause, prosecution only, uh, grand jury can ask questions, subpoena people or documentation, and the grand jury is held in secret. Let me ask you this. What makes more sense, just logically, that the grand jury is there to accuse me and you of felonies that we commit against each other, like a rapist raping a 12-year-old child, and the grand jury is supposed to show the probable cause, like they're talking about in the James Sapp case with Greg Newman. Because that just doesn't make any sense to me. They're going to face a jury anyways, and the grand jury can't do anything except say, oh, yeah, there's probable cause. The judge should be able to make that decision on their own. Judges know what probable cause is. They, they know the law. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not stupid people. They all went to law school. And not only that, they practiced law for, for many years before they became a judge. So, so they know. Or does it make more sense that they're talking about finding probable cause when the government's charging government officers? Because the first place we really see it is in the Fifth Amendment. 
And the reason they put that in the Fifth Amendment was because before the Revolutionary War, the king was just charging people that he thought were betraying him or weren't going along with his interests. And there was no grand jury. There was no indictment. There was no, like, hey, what's the evidence? What's the probable cause? It was just, hey, I'm the king. You're charged. Oh, yeah, and now we're going to bring you overseas, and we're going to put you on trial over here. And we know that this happened because they wrote it in the Declaration of Independence. So, yeah, there's that. And then the prosecution. The prosecution's the only side allowed to be heard. Well, this goes together with the secrecy. And that is when a grand jury is investigating a crime and putting a case together, because they're charging government officers, because they're looking at government officials, they don't wish to announce it. They don't wish to tell everybody that they're doing it because of fear of retribution. That makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's why a grand jury is held in secret. And then let's go to the grand jury can ask questions and subpoena evidence and documents. Same thing. The, the government, the government that we set up here in the United States after the Revolutionary War is supposed to be a government for the people, for us, to protect us and our rights and what we wish to do and our freedoms. So they should be able to get governmental documents, anything that the government has. They should be able to subpoena it to make sure that there's not a crime going on. And there's really no other way to have it. And if you don't think that a grand jury has this kind of power, because, I mean, last video I talked about how they were making it for kings. Let me just put it to you this way. Because in the first video, I was talking about, you know, Republicans, Democrats, grand juries watching over them. In Watergate, a grand jury got the Nixon tapes from his office, made him hand over his own tapes because of a grand jury subpoena. Okay, Supreme Court upheld it. So there, a grand jury was going after a Republican. In Whitewater with Bill Clinton, it was because the grand jury subpoenaed Bill Clinton to come and testify before them, which is the whole reason they had the impeachment process. That's where they were saying Bill Clinton committed perjury was in front of the grand jury. So there's an example of a Republican and a Democrat that a grand jury held liable. If you look at some other things that they talk about, like in North Carolina, grand jury serves a term of one year. This makes a lot of sense. 25 people serving one year. They can each take a day or two a month and go into government offices and look through the files, look through the records, look for discrepancies, look for things like in the file of a, of a rape case and nobody, nobody notified the family. Nobody called the victim. And they can say, hey, this doesn't look right. You might not be fulfilling your governmental duties. We might wish to investigate this. And that investigation could lead to an indictment. That's the way it's supposed to work. And the truth is, is the system at this point is so far gone that you don't see a real grand jury working like that. Because a grand jury is strictly a common law thing. And now it's all regulated by statutes, by statues, by idols of the state. That's not a real grand jury. It's not. See, they have taken absolutely everything, all of the power that we had to hold them really accountable. They've taken it away, they flipped it on its head, and now they tell us it doesn't exist anymore. And it won't. Unless you start holding them accountable. Unless you start informing other people of how it's supposed to really work. Because without that, we're lost. It's done. It's over.
They, I mean, they, they've already got us in checkmate. It's not even funny. And like I said, I hope that it doesn't come to fighting. But the only way it's not going to come to fighting is if we start getting law upheld. And with the grand jury, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, what does the average person know about law? Well, I'd say the average person knows that it's unlawful to let rapists walk. So that's a better job than, than Greg Newman and the people who judged him from the Bar Association. True law, it's written on your heart. You know the difference between right and wrong. That's it. After that, there's just a couple of things that anybody can read in the Constitution, like victims' rights. And then it's just common sense. We know when people do things unlawful. And there's a saying I have, and that is, just because it's not illegal doesn't mean it isn't criminal. Anyways... Thanks for watching. I hope you like, share, subscribe, comment. And I don't know how many people are commenting or how many people aren't commenting because I see comments pop up, disappear. I try to respond. It doesn't go anywhere. It's pretty insane. So again, if you're really, if you're really about making a change without getting violent, show this to somebody and talk with them about it. Much love. I am just conspiracy, and I just wish to conspire with other good people of this planet to leave a better world for future generations than the world we all grew up in. And the three yes. things that are perhaps most important in it are one clause that people always forget. It's clause 61, and it's from this that we take the very vivid principle that nobody is above the law. No king, king anointed, God's servant, inherits by divine luck, you could call it, but right. Now every king in medieval Europe made an oath that he'd be a good king, do lots of justice, look after lots of poor people, all the sort of things that you'd want your new king to do. But in medieval Europe, if the king didn't, answer, didn't provide justice and so on and so forth, I'm afraid they took the view that he had to answer to God in heaven. Well, when the king's dead, it's not much good if you've had no justice or you've not been properly looked after. And what Magna Carta did was to say in Clause 61, if the king does not abide by the charter when he's notified that he's in breach of it, in effect, a council of 25 barons can take over the running of the kingdom. They're not to harm him, they're not to injure him, they're not, of course, to treat him with violence or his family, but they're no longer stuck with their oaths of allegiance and fealty. This, I think, is a fantastically important moment. Suddenly, the king is answerable on earth, not just in heaven. And from this, we derive constant references through the Middle Ages to the king not being above the law. The law comes first, the king comes second, he's certainly the most important person in the kingdom, but he is beneath the law. And that, I think, leads us to this, I think, really important point, which it's easy in a democracy to overlook, but which in any dictatorship would be no trouble at all. No king is above the law, no president is above the law, no executive is above the law, everyone is answerable, for his actions or her actions in court. And that leads to the second, but I'm not going to talk about this too long, but we're all entitled to justice. The, the, the clauses don't just say justice, they talk about right and justice. Now, there weren't many rights about in 1215, but over the centuries our rights have come to be established. And you find the preservation, the entitlement to a court system that will preserve your rights is there found within the Charter. And I regard the insistence in the Charter on right and justice as being its second most important legacy to us, because again, here in the office, 
of Chief Justice of the United States, the office I once held in England, we are there responsible for seeing that justice is available to all our citizens, even if they're taking on the president or they're taking on the government, the prime minister in our case, or a great local body, great local authority. These rights are recognized in the charter. The barons weren't thinking of us. The barons weren't, you know, full of ideas about voting. Of course they weren't. But as our country developed, and then yours did uh, from ours in the constitutional arrangements, um, these things became part of the country. In England now, if somebody says something, you know, let's do something that most people would regard as diabolical and dictatorial, um, everybody says, well, it's against Magna Carta. It isn't against Magna Carta. There isn't a word in Magna Carta about trial by jury. But people think of Magna Carta as representing their rights, their entitlements, the need for justice to be done, and most important of all, equality before the law. I'm sorry I've gone on too long there. Oh, no, no, that's quite all right, because that leads right into the second question that I was, uh, and in relation of Magna Carta, uh, specifically to the law, and you'd mentioned.